Herkese iyi akşamlar. Arka Sanat Merkezi'ne tekrar hoş geldiniz. Bir konferans daha ile aramızda olmaktan çok mutluluk duyuyoruz. Bu akşam Profesör Rolf Zahsi aramızda. Kendisini ben tanıtmayacağım çünkü konuşmasının bir kısmı kendisini tanıtmaktan geçiyor. O yüzden bu e, şerefi bize verdiği için teşekkür ediyorum ve konuşmasında bol keyif alıyorum. Thank you very much for introducing me. Dear Mr. Arkas, dear Ahmed Yatu, dear Mrs. Betül, dear Mr. Ayotti, ladies and gentlemen, I'm incredibly honored to be here. I'm absolutely happy that I got the opportunity to uh, introduce myself and this lecture on the position of uh, Ahmed Atu in the history of photography, especially on the history of architecture photography. Um, quite unusually, I would like to introduce myself first. Um, you shouldn't start a lecture like this, but uh, in this case, I feel the obligation to do so because my own life way, and uh, Artu and I are exactly the same age, uh, born in the same year, um, is exactly opposite his way. I started as a professional photographer with uh, very good studios and I could finance all of my studies by doing professional photography, especially architecture photography. And later in my life I had the opportunity to write a number of books on architecture and photography and especially on architectural photography. You see a number of them. Unfortunately, most of them are published in German languages or in bilingual uh, examples, so you will have to deal with that. My lecture has three aims or three subjects. First is a short account of the history of uh, architectural photography in general. The second will be on architecture photography as an art of its own within the art of photography, which has ha only had been uh, made knowledgeable and famous within the last three decades. And the third aim, of course, is placing Ahmed Ertu within this type of new written art history. So I would like to start with a short history of architectural photography, especially looking at Turkey and uh, wherever possible on Izmir. Um, of course, there was perspective and panorama before architectural photography, before photography. One of the earliest examples of that may be uh, the panorama of Constantinople made by the, you can name him, Belgium, you can name him Dutch, you can name him French, Melchior Lorik, uh, painted, made in, in 1559. And it's no uh, mistake, no uh, account, no incidence that uh, Ahmed Ertu produced an extreme nice and well prepared facsimile edition of exactly this panorama with lots of material around it. Another step in preparing photography to exist is then uh, Friedemann de Vries, father and son, with the help of Hendrik Andreas. The treatises on perspective construction basically f f uh, founded and made in 1604 and 05, published in 1610 in two editions. These constructions were the, not only in use by architects, they were not only showing that architecture is something that you have to deal with as an art, but it shows that architectural imagining, the architecture imagery as a whole, could be an art of its own, which was hitherto unknown. And you see that we slowly walk into photography. Uh, the architectural alphabet of uh, Johann David Steingruber, an architect totally unknown for any work that he could have done, 
uh, he published an architectural alphabet in 1773 only by showing that he could invent things and could invent an architecture that existed as an image but not in real. So the image becomes as important as the subject itself and the image becomes even more important than the photograph or the, the, uh, the, the actual building. The image becomes a lot more important than building it, making it up, it will be then shown to the public as an image on its own. A last step just prior to the invention of photography, one of the main subjects of my work in the last three or four decades in the history of architectural photography were the last 60 years before photography was actually invented. It was invented within one year by at least 25 totally unknowing and not knowing each other inventors at the same, in the same year. So there must have been a development before. And parts of the development is not only in techniques, in physics, in chemistry and all this kind of stuff that is well known to historians today, but a part of the history is in developing the need for photographs, developing the need for images taken by a camera obscura and fixed by a chemical process. And one of the steps into that is a totally different uh, idea of what an image would be like, of what an image could need, what an image could me uh, mean. And there's an anonymous uh, writer who wrote a book in 1788 in German on uh, the psychological imprint that the form of architecture makes on men. So he's talking about mean houses and good houses. He's talking about bad houses and good houses. He's talking about uh, nice people living in nice houses and bad people housing in bad houses and things like that just from the silhouette of the houses. Of course there had been silhouettes taken by uh, Joseph Karl Lavater, uh, somebody who made a big influence on uh, Johann Goethe as a, as a writer. Lavater said if you look at persons and you look at their silhouette you will be able to understand what their mind is about. So this anonymous architect wanted to have studies like that on houses. And you needed that to be able to have an importance of images of architectural buildings and things. The exact opposite way was taken by a, uh, an architect, you could name a number of them in France or in England, but uh, choose a German one who is well known, Karl Friedrich Schinkel. He, when he didn't have money for building himself, when he didn't have commissions for building himself, he designed prospects for operas, like the Mozart's Magic Flute. And uh, if you look at these prospects, they look like an opera house, like being photographed by Ahmed R2. You have a very similar view of this and the prospect is very relevant to many things. A number of light artists today use these prospects for their own work. And when Schinkel gave a perspective of his own museum at the Lustgarten later in his life, um, when he was on the peak of his knowledge of, as an architect, when he was on the peak of his influence as an architect, he designs a comparatively small museum and proposes it with a large image uh, with very wide angle perspectives uh, to make it bigger, to make it larger, to make the vestibule, this first floor, which is meant to host uh, the important visitors to the museum, like the king or like uh, other people, noble people. He uh, designs this in a way that it looks a lot larger than it had been and then it had been planned. If you take the left side of it here and you see the two people standing there, this side is only two meters long, so, but it looks like a large space. And so all this was invented before photography came. Uh, it all was there and 
even the propagandic use that uh, Schinkel made of photography. Very last piece in the preparation of architectural photography might be this carte de visite by the industrialist Friedrich Krupp. It's one of the very first known carte de visites with an image on them and what he shows is a uh, rectangular view of his premises, of his company, which was unknown to them too. It's shown by the cavalry perspective, the perspective that you have on a building when you stand on a high hill, like a general who's promoting an army. And uh, he released that, it's a steel engraving in 15 different colors. So it's a very delicate object uh, showing his company and he developed that for an important industrial fair, one of the very earliest industrial fairs at all in Paris in 1832, long before the world fairs began. Unfortunately, it didn't help. He went bankrupt the same year. But uh, it didn't stop him from funding the next company and the next company and the next company and then the Krupp history began. So architectural imagery helps in industry too. Then comes this magic year, 1839, when photography was named to be invented. Nobody had a name for this process. So when Jacques Mandeur, Daguerre began with this process, he named it Daguerreotype or Daguerreotype, and others may use their name for their own types, for their own works. And he invented a silver plate with an image on. Most of you who know about the uh, history of photography will know how it's made. And of course it is a printing plate. It wasn't meant as a, an engraving. It was meant to be prepared as an engraving. There had been many attempts to do so, like the one that I'm showing on the right side, Henri Fizeau, an image of Saint-Sulpice in Paris which was printed from a photographic plate. The problem was you could only print three or four prints from them and they didn't work as printing. So photography was invented, but it wasn't there. It was not a medium. It was just a technical work, but it was not yet a medium. But all of the French inventors had a good reason for showing examples of their work with architecture, of course. Architecture was the easiest subject of photography because it didn't run away. If you take eight hours of uh, uh, exposure time, if you take 20 minutes of exposure time, it ne means that no person can be seen alive. Um, so you have to find subjects that don't run away and architecture, of course, is the easiest of them. But in 1833, there was a commission founded on the preservation of historical monuments by Prosper Merimé, an important politician in France, important, uh, I say, bourgeois politician in France. And he asked for this commission because Victor Hugo had just finished his long novel on the history of Notre Dame de Paris. And this uh, novel described in what bad shape Notre Dame was at the time because people did not take care uh, for religion, they did not take care for the building. So Victor Hugo with his novel invented architectural preservation. He said we have to have Notre Dame not for religion, we have to have Notre Dame as a symbol of Paris. We have to have images of Notre Dame to show others what Paris is about, because Notre Dame is the most important building in Paris. So you have to have a need for images, you have to have this. Of course, all the early inventors tried to work on how to deal with that, on how to work with uh, commissioned uh, works on the preservation. And Hippolyte Bayard, one of the many inventors of photography, uh, started very early with uh, photographing the windmills on Montmartre Hill and he started with many other works until in 1980, 1851, I'm sorry, in, in 1851 there was a Mission Héliographique founded by this commission of the Monument Historique 
and uh, five photographers were asked to do long lines, long series of photographs of uh, important monuments. They re either received lists or they decided themselves on which monuments to take photographs of. Hippolyte Bayard was working in Paris because basically he was busy with his own subjects, with his own uh, premises as a studio owner and so on, so he didn't move away from Paris, so he took the part of the Paris photographs. Uh, Henri Lesec was a specialist in medieval sculpture because he was an important uh, collector of medieval sculpture. There's still a Musée Lesec in Rouen in northern France, a very important museum on uh, cast iron sculpture. And uh, so Henri Lesec was doing photographs of the sculptures. A Mr. Mestral, a Monsieur Mestral, was only an O. We n never found any notice whether he was named Olivier or Oscar or whatever. So we only know O. Mestral. He was the photographer of the south east and southwest of France. Gustave Legray, he was an important uh, printing technology, uh, technologician and he knew about anything about presenting photographs. Gustave Legray was chosen to take care of the big castles of feudal times. And the most important photographer was the fifth and he leads directly into the work of Ahmed R2. It was Edouard Denis Baldus coming from German backgrounds and for the Commission, uh, for the Mission de Heliographique, he worked on uh, antique buildings, either in Nîmes, Orange, uh, in, in other places, Lyon and so on, Vienne. And, uh, but at the same time, he started to do commissions for modern buildings. He started to record uh, <coughs> modern buildings, modern things. So he started a commission for the Baron de Rothschild who produced a railway line between Paris and many other cities in France. And for each of these new railway lines, uh, Baldus received the known commission of taking photographs. And what you see on the right side of this plate here, you see the, the, bar, uh, the station of Toulon, the railway station of Toulon, just short after its opening in 1856. And there you see the typical Baldus view, which is a view that became canonical for architectural photography and for the work of Ahmed Artu as well. It's a straight, flat view on the building with a large depth of field into a foreign or a far away depth. So what you see here with these lines of the rails, with uh, looking through the the railway station into the landscape behind the railway station is a very typical early example of the art of architectural photography. Not to mention that this building, uh, this photograph, the photograph of this building was sold as early as 1981 for a, a six uh, column subject on, in dollars, so something like $110,000 in 1981, which was, was very early for collecting photographs. Uh, with all these commissions, uh, the local commissions came, photography became a part of preservation campaigns. So uh, Baron Osman, who changed Paris with all the big boulevards and cordons and so on, as you know it, and made this uh, a subject for all other cities following him, like Izmir too. And, but uh, Osman commissioned Chalmaville to take photographs of all the old quarters that he was to tear down. And some of the quarters survived, others didn't. Charles Negre, another photographer, did that on, without commission, did it on himself, and he took a photograph of his friend Henri Lesec on the Cathedral of Notre Dame. And you, then you see how this photograph was changed into an etching by Charles Merillon, Le Strige. This uh, is a very famous etching on the history of Paris. The same you can see within any other country, of course, taking uh, some time to be understood. 
any country that became aware of its own history started doing things later on and started to preserve its old building, tried to preserve its heritage. And uh, for Turkey, you can absolutely clear, clarify these ideas within the 1950s, 60s, and 80s. And to my knowledge, Ahmed Ertu was a part of that deliverance in the 1980s as an architect. So he went into the preservation by photographs by starting as an architect with a knowledge in preservation that he had, of course, developed in earlier times. And photography became famous as an art for collecting things that are gone. And by, because the photographers seem to know that things will be gone in due time and that we have to make photographs of them. When I started an architectural photography competition in 1990s, in the early 1990s, uh, we had to submit the catalog by selling advertisements. And one of the companies, the uh, architectural companies, that uh, commissioned an advertising for this catalog, they had written into that, architectures come and go and photographs will stay which is, of course, a total turn to anything that was known before. Architecture was to be known the art that stays forever, and now photography seems to be staying longer than built architecture, which is a change, and which was, of course, instigated by photography in the 19th century already. Like Thomas Annan, when he photographed the old closes of Glasgow, of course he wanted people to move out of these dirty, uh, derelict areas that, that were not healthful to the people who had to live in that. But of course, they were torn down afterwards, so what survived are these beautiful photographs by Thomas Annan. The same with Eugène Adjé, who took photographs basically uh, on the subject of um, impressive views that were taken over by his friends of, as artists, uh, who did paint after these photographs, but of course he collected any views that show a Paris that is long gone, but which is kept in memories of millions of people today. And the most famous example of that in today may be the work of Hiller and Bernd Becher. And uh, after Bernd Becher died in 2007, and so they had ceased to work some 10 years before, but around that time, um, Hiller Becher gave an interview and said, the most important part of our work is not that it's considered as big art by the art market. It's not important that we are praised for conceptual clarity of our work. The most important thing is that only 2% of the buildings that we photographed survived. So we saved at least the image of 98% of the buildings that are shown here which means none of the gas tanks you see on the right side is there anymore. And that's quite important as a method of showing. I was lucky enough to instigate a collection of photographs in the 1990s when Germany was unified. Um, then I could, uh, I say, um, yeah, instigate a uh, company, an uh, energy supply company, to start a photographic collection and start a photographic collection of all the buildings in eastern Germany that were to be torn down by the process of the unification. And I was able to ask a number of former GDR photographers, young photographers whom, whom I was teaching at the time, um, I could ask them to go into their archives, look for very old photographs or take few photographs in the early 90s and then return to the places a few years later, as you see it on the lines here, um, and take another view of the same object and of the same subject, how it changed. And if they would go there for a third time, it would be a totally different change as well today. Which guides me away from preservation, away from 
keep photography as a medium of memory into modern photography, which is a, di a different thing on its own. First into the collaboration of modern architects with photographers, which I must admit did not exist. Walter Gropius was totally uninterested in the work of the photographers who took photographs of his work. He was interested in these photographs being printed. He wanted to be, wanted to be a famous architect. He wanted to be a famous designer. But he wasn't interested in how these photographs were made. They simply had to be there. So when Lucia Moholy decided to take a photograph of the curtain windows of the Bauhaus building in Dessau in 1926, early 1926 or late 1925. The only thing that Gropius was interested in was placing this Adler car exactly below the corner because he knew the corner was to be praised by all architectural historians. But he was the chief designer of the Adler cars at the time. He was a chief automobile designer at the time. He was better known as an automobile designer at the time than as an architect. And so he wanted to have his car placed very well. Lucia Moholy, who did the photograph, gave me a long interview exactly on this photograph, describing how often she had the car to be moved back and forth until he had the idea, this is the ideal position for the car. The same happens with Ludwig Mies van der Rohe or with Erik Mendelssohn. The left side showing that the name of Sasha Stone, who is a very, very famous avant-garde photographer of the 1920s. This was only found out by a young German art historian a year ago. One year ago, it was found out the, that the hitherto anonymous phot photographs were subscribed and strictly subscribed to uh, Sasha Stone. So we know it now, but nobody was interested Neither Ludwig Mies van der Rohe was interested, Lady Reich was a bit interested, but she died very early. So uh, they didn't co cooperate with the photographers. This was only with very few architects and photographers who became friends. Hugo Schmelz, his son will be an important part of the second part of the lecture, worked together with Dominikus Böhm, a lesser known modern architect in the 1920s in Germany. They were close friends. They went together to the places, took the photographs together. The same with Werner Manz and Wilhelm Rippan on the right side. But it's extremely rare. I did not find any example for that in either England or uh, France at the same time with modern architects. The distribution form of architectural photography and modernism. It's very important to understand why it's so difficult that architectural photography became an art of its own. Because the distribution form was either the illustrated magazine, like you see it on the bottom left, or it was even more important, the picture postcard. Picture postcard is always underestimated as a medium. Uh, a, a, Illustrated paper like the Communist Arbeiter Illustrated Zeitung had an issue of something like five to eight thousand uh, copies. A picture postcard was sold in copies of sixty thousand to a hundred thousand. Even a million wasn't that rare at the time. So picture postcards were a far more important medium, but they are totally forgotten today. And of course, everybody knows photographic books of the 1920s. They were extremely rare, they were extremely expensive, and they're even more rare today and well sought after by antiquaries. I jump in modern photography to the 1950s, to the post-war, post-Second War area, and show just a few examples that guide you slowly into the art of Ahmed Ertu and his contemporaries. Karl Hugo Schmelz, the son of Hugo Schmelz, which I had shown before, he was one of the most famous photographers in post-war Germany, like Heinrich Heidersberger, both of them very clear, very strict, modern, black and white, very uh, accurate uh, and large format. Uh, I was an apprentice with Karl Hugo Schmelz in the 1960s. I started learning photography from scratch. And uh, I remember that I printed this uh, image on uh, two meters height and one meter twenties width, which was quite a large print at the time in the 1960s. So, and 
We, he was clear about that this print should show each stone here and each arm of grass and whatever was on the building clearly enough. The last one of these modern lines, postmodern photographers in the 1980s, 70s and 80s was Reinhard Wolf. Unluckily, totally unknown today because of his early death in 1988. Um, Reinhard Wolf was the most lux luxurious photographer in the world and when I was able to curate a show on the history of color photography, he provided us with a large format, real large format color photograph of uh, a New York uh, house, of a New York skyscraper. Uh, the print was three meters high and one meter fifty wide, which was in 1981 in color. It, as a C print, this was nearly impossible at the time. Uh, so he had to have some, some kind of special people, special equipment made doing it for him in Japan at the time uh, because they were the only ones to do it. That's technical data but it shows that the size of photographs became more important and became more part of the art. And that's one of the reasons why you're sitting beside, in, within these large format photographs of Ahmed Ertu. The last one of these modernists may be shown by his magazine and I'm sure we've been talking about it a bit that uh, he was an important figure for Ahmed Ertu, Futagawa Yukio. Uh, he started a magazine in the 1970s, Global Architecture, the first one to show that architecture is a global phenomenon, to show that it doesn't mean any difference when you go anywhere that you have to ha can, can, can find good modern architecture th which is worth being shown, being printed. The magazine itself has a huge format. You cannot see it from the projection here, but uh, it's roughly 45 centimeters to 35 centimeters. So that's a large format for a magazine in the 1970s. Uh, so he was uh, very early with all these developments. Which guides me into the work of uh, Ahmed Ertu. And uh, of course, he corresponds being an artist of today. Knowingly or unknowingly, he corresponds to all the developments I have given to you. And that's the importance of my introduction here that you might see some relevance and decide yourself what kind of relevance it has. And except for these two images, uh, the next images I'm going to show are all parts of this exhibition. I'm very grateful to uh, the curators of the show here that uh, they uh, gave me the scans for preparing the lecture and uh, showing these things. The next one is not with it, but uh, then we start with the images from this show here. Ahmed Ertu studied architecture in the 1970s. The 1970s in England were the famous time following the 1960s uh, of utopian ideas in architecture, like the group Archi Archigram with uh, its uh, main figures like Ron Herron, and they started showing architecture at the time which could be built with the media of the time but which was difficult to build at the time because we didn't have computers or the average computers that we needed for that but at least he shown they shown the direction in which architecture would go or could go not the architecture would walk but but people would walk on architecture like on the millennium bridge uh, it, up to the way to St. Peter's in London. And uh, another model of that, a biggest part of these utopian ideas were Japanese architects. They named themselves metabolistic and uh, Isozaki Arata was one of the more important uh, Kenzo Tange, Tange Kenzo and, and others too, but uh, you might name them. And it, I find it very interesting that Ahmed Ertu at some point of our conversation 
started to show me that he did industrial photographs, which reminded me very much of these metabolistic architectures. And, but of course, he relates to Turkish photography, or may say, to the photography of Turkey in the 19th and 20th century. That's basically a history of travel photography, a travel photography that in the first glance looks a bit like colonial photography. But I would never say this would be the case for Turkey because uh, Turkey was always part of the Grand Tour and Grand Tour countries, even for the British, were not part of colonization. They were part of interests, they were part of political interests, and of course they were part of suppression, but they were not treated that like the Chinese or like the Indians or whatever. Uh, they were not really considered as colonies. There was a sort of uh, cultural heritage that was there and which was given there and sh should be shown there. So when James Robertson, an American who came via England, uh, to Constantinople, as it was named at the time. He took, of course, a photograph of the Sweetwater Fountain. And today, in the hotel, I found an advertising on Mercedes-Benz cars with, which used the Sweetwater Fountain. So you always have these images. They seem to be a part of travel image of Turkey. But uh, to me, more important is a photographer who's more or less unknown today a Swedish photographer living in Constantinople in the 1870s, Guillaume Bergrin, and he took a long series of the Hagia Sophia, which of course had problems in technical qualities of the time, but which of course formed the views that were taken over by Ahmed Ertu in his wonderful book on the Hagia Sophia. The same goes for the Abdullah Freres, who were then Turkish photographers living in Turkey at least for two decades and took photographs of nearly every subject available. Their distribution was similar to the picture postcard. They were selling small format images to tourists and to people. I, I considerably show a page of uh, Ahmed Ertu's wonderful book on Sinan. Uh, that you understand um, he's using a different medium for his photographs. Uh, the book is the medium in this time. Uh, Zibai Joyer, uh, Ahmed Ertu was proud enough to show these books and self-confident enough to show these images in his own book on the Hagia Sophia. So I took these images from his book on the Hagia Sophia and he did not even contrast them in the simple way I do it here for uh, the reason of the lecture, but uh, you can see it how, how it works with it. And of course he had different methods and different possibilities of showing things, but Ziba and Joyer were quite accurate in their view, were quite perfect in their view, uh, only had problems in technically having these things proposed further on. But it's a part of history. A history that might be unknown to Ahmed R2 because it's very difficult to trace is an important collection of photographs uh, I have the good luck now to get through and curate a show that will be opened in September uh, 2013 in my hometown Bonn. Uh, Les Archives de la Planète by the banker Albert Kahn. Albert Kahn instigated in 1908 five photographers to tour worldwide, take color photographs of the world on Lumiere Autochrome. Color, which is a complicated format, if anybody wants to know technical details, I'll do that. Um, and uh, until he had to stop it after this uh, uh, world crisis, uh, economic crisis in 1929, he had collected more than a hundred thousand photographs of this by his five photographers. And prior to World War I, he at least had 2,500 already, and we're showing these early ones. 
There are only very few examples of Turkey in this collection. Maybe we have to trace them better because the collection was forgotten for more than half a century. And I was lucky to reinvent this collection in 1977 when I was preparing a show on color photography. And then the French state took it over. But in the moment the French state took it over, you were not able to uh, borrow an image from them anymore. So, but today we are lucky we can do work with the material. So there is only very few material left from uh, Turkey and uh, I think at least the image of the French consulate at Bursa might be shown here publicly for the first time since it was taken in August 1913. Very important for the work of Ahmed R2 are other influences that decide exactly why he is a Turkish or may say oriental photographer compared to many of his contemporaries which I'm going to show soon um, but it's very important to say that he's not only been influenced by photography itself but by uh, illustration by color uh, uh, schemes and so on the illustrations of the Shahnameh for instance in many manuscripts uh, known from the 16th century onwards, mostly Persian, some of them Turkish, but mostly Persian, um, have to be read from bottom up, which is totally unknown to any European reader. It's a totally different way of looking at things. But if you want to understand the story in these illustrations, you have to read them bottom up, and from right to left and left back to right, and so on, and uh, this is very difficult for a European viewer. We have to train that, we have to learn that, and uh, those people who are not trained in it will not understand the photographs of Ahmed Ertu considerably. And the same is with carpets, the same with the color schemes of carpets, the color schemes of uh, material. Lots of these photographs of the opera houses uh, have a lot to do with the color schemes of Orientals. And uh, not only that these colors were sh chosen by Oriental fashions in the late 18th, early 19th century, for instance, uh, with the Palais Garnier even very late in the 19th century, but as well as uh, being chosen deliberately by Ahmed Ertu when he chose the opera houses that he took photographs of to know, okay, these are looking oriental enough in a certain flavor or so from their color schemes. It's only about the color schemes, it's not about the view. And uh, you have to decide these perfectly. Uh, needless to say that uh, Ahmed Ertu published at least one or two books on Turkish carpentry. The book as a medium very important today. I'm part of a scientific research program on the history of the photographic book. And there are two collectors worldwide publishing now. There are huge, enormous book collections in several aspects and uh, not knowing how many photographic books have been made both in the 19th and the 20th century. So Ahmed Ertu deals with the history of the book of course, this is an exhibition, but by the shape and size of the catalogue, you can understand how he books, his books look like. There's an example upstairs of one of his books, too, that you can have a look on. And why he chooses to make these enormous, expensive, difficult to handle and hard to keep books that, by the way, anyway, are wonderful items to be living with. And you live with them for a lifetime. Of course, he has to deal with uh, the enormous amount of work that photography can make. Large format photography is hard. The Frébisson went up the Mont Blanc mountain in 1863 and for taking 15 photographs, they used three months, 16 men, only 14 survived, uh, six, and uh, afterwards they went bankrupt because the photographs didn't sell. 
but they are the most beautiful photographs you can imagine on the Mont Blanc mountain. So there's an enormous amount of material economics involved to make photographs like this and this has a history in its own. This is important to have the history in its background. There's a history of lighting in photographs. This is a slightly unfair to show these images together. The large form at Opera Garnier by Ahmed Ertou and uh, on the left side the ancient crypt in Provence taken by Frederick Henri Evans. Whoever knows Frederick Evans um, will know that his photographs were no larger than 12 to 15 centimeters, so smaller than a postcard, because they were done in a very expensive platinum print process. But the light is important. Frederick Evans invented the light in interior photography and set the light. And the cooperation with light and the idea about lighting building and how to light a building like an opera house or like a library is important enough for uh, Ahmed Ertu to be considered in that. We're coming into modern photography and the most important part of modern photography was invented pr uh, after World War I, uh, named in the American uh, I say terminology uh, straight photography. Straight photography means photography with the means of photography, say technical, perfect technique, perfection. A print like a photograph, it doesn't pretend to be anything but a photograph, but in the way it is done, it is art. Paul Strand started with that and Ahmed Ertu follows this line, of course. He's standing in the tradition and he has minor aspects of this tradition. An important figure in this tradition is Edward Weston, but he could set a pepper into the scene like an erotic example and even better than a nude woman or something like this. He could make it more erotic than anything else. The same works with uh, Ahmed Ertu when he takes the Palau de Musica in Barcelona and showing this jumping horse in the front. And just here in the exhibition, when you're standing in front of this horse, it's more impressive than the whole room behind it, but of course it's part of the image, part of the building. You have to walk along and see into the building after moving away from the horse. This is what he took from this. Of course, the flat view, the straight view, like uh, Edouard Baldus was using, it was reinvented into straight photography by Walker Evans in his work that he did for the Farm Security Administration in the 1930s. And since Walker Evans, no photographer can escape the flat view, the straight line. And exactly this is what you see on this wonderful of the image of the Melk Abbey Library, which is hanging so perfectly in this room here up above. Stephen Shaw started in photography with the color, with naming the color again, with showing up the color if there wasn't Stephen Shaw with his very boring images of American suburbs and, and landscapes, I think nobody would have considered me asking me for the curation of a show on the history of color photography in 1981. So uh, he had been famous in the 1970s with this new color photography and Ahmed Ertu of course follows this and to me, a very good example of this is the Herzog August Library in Wolfenbüttel, which has been more or less destroyed in his old view by the modern architecture in it. But what does uh, Ahmed Ertu? He simply chooses on looking at the color, giving more impact to the color than to this bad architecture of the building. And of course, landscape, panorama, something I had to take from Ahmed Ertu's website. Uh, Cappadocia, not far away from here, and one of the big influences in color landscape photography, Hamaye Roshi, with this image of Honshu. There's a German standing in front of you, and so we have to talk about German efficiency. Um, and uh, I wrote an article 15 years ago on the history of made in Germany as an image in photography, because all this nuisance about made in Germany, all this 
kind of appeal that Mercedes cars have and BMW cars have and these kind of things well known in Turkey as well in any other country um, come from photographic images because when they were proposed to do something about the imagery the German companies came up with these flat images on white backgrounds saying okay let's show the purity of our developments let's show the purity of our crafts let's show the pu purity of our tools and a similarity the straight view and the very small background this is something that of course Ahmed Ertu shares with this kind of German appeal which is prolonged in German straight photography by the photographer Albert Renger Patsch and his famous book uh, Die Welt ist schön which he wanted to name the things even you can even go further on and uh, one of the big uh, new knowledges that we have about Sasha Stone by Birgit Hammers, this uh, historian who invented, reinvented Sasha Stone into avant-garde photography uh, recently, uh, she found five uh, photo montages showing if Berlin was, and one of the five places in the world was Constantinople. So he made this wonderful photo montage I, I'm sure that it's the first time that this is shown publicly too here. Um, and uh, because Birgit, yeah, Birgit did show it when she gave a conference last year in Marburg. So it's uh, the second time that this image is shown of, uh, publicly. And uh, Ahmed Ertu took a similar method of doing what he names conceptual photographs, which I would name uh, very perfect photo montages. And of course, the quality of uh, detail with the Becher photography, where he's always uh, accused of being the follower or an epigon, which is not, which he's not, as I have shown, but he's compared to these. And of course, he's compared to many other photographers of a so called Dusseldorf or Leipzig school. But tracing back into imagery, you have to show that. There are longer lines of traditions of well-prepared photographs. Karl Hugo Schmölz, whom I named several times, uh, did photographs uh, of cinema places uh, in the 1950s, hundreds, hundreds of them. Uh, we could make a book out of his cinema photographs, um, and uh, which is, of course, similar to being shown like uh, the uh, opera houses by Ahmed R2 because Karl Hugo simply stood up in front of the screen and took a photograph from the top position of the screen. Helga Schmidt-Glasnow, who was an important photographer on the preservation of buildings after the Second World War, made roughly like 300 photographic books with architectural photographs. And one of her most important books is a book on libraries, which was, of course, well known to others when they did it. She prepared a book, this is another example, and then you see she took different subjects, but in a similar position. And this is very similar to be seen, this uh, Wiblingen Abbey book, and then on the right side, an image that you can see uh, stair above. And of course, all these books are compared, and books of uh, Ahmed R2 are compared in Germany now to the work of Candida Höfer. The problem with Candida Höfer is both she was an apprentice to Karl Hugo Schmölz, so, and she always told me I don't do anything else but taking the same way of photographs that we did in the 1960s, but with less perfection because I'm not interested in perfection. And uh, she knew all the books by Helga schmidt gassner where she chooses her, her subjects from, which is a fair program. And of course, her interests are totally different. Her, yeah, she has a totally different interest. She's showing a room. She always says, I never love to be more than 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour in one of these rooms, because I want to keep up the immediate memory that I keep of this room. And I want to, simply want to reproduce this memory with my camera. So it's an entirely different program even if the images look similar. Where typically to be shown is, is when you look at Trinity College Library in Dublin, 
Or if you look at the opera Garnier, she made a book on the opera Garnier. She ran through each room and simply took a photograph of the situation as it was, very quickly. Uh, very, uh, she was more or less downsizing this big opera program into her personal memory, which is an entirely different attitude towards the building. It's an entirely different attitude towards the photography. It's an entirely different attitude towards the imagery of architecture in art. A more common or more new uh, combination, a relation, more contemporary relation, I would like to draw your interest to, which is only a short hint, it doesn't mean too much, but uh, it could be known. The influence of architectural photography on the design of computer games today is extreme. And I've, um, I have a common lecture which is uh, given quite often to a number of audiences on uh, the history of architecture in relation to the history of computer games. And uh, so you see this uh, Snowhütte uh, impression of an opera house in Oslo has a lot to do with uh, these imaginary rooms for uh, first-person or third-person shooters uh, in computer games, even more open with the work of Jean Nouvel or Santiago Calatrava. Uh, I've just read a, a PhD work of one of my students who finished his PhD on the relation of Santiago Calatrava's work and the computer games who use his architecture in the games. So I would like to end up with a simple sentence. There's a title of an image of a, of a painting that I will not show you. It's called The Holy Family or The Art of Rising a Curtain. Of course, some of you might know that this painting was made by Rembrandt in 1646 and it shows that the viewer has to draw a curtain away from the scene to be able to understand what goes on in the scene. So what I can advise you here, Ahmed Ertu has shown the curtains, you have to draw them. Thank you very much and I'm open for any question that you have. Mr. Rolf Sasse, it was a delightful lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing caught my attention while I was listening to you. Uh, in, the, in the early times of the photography, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to put this because it was a hell of a lot of information, but in the early times of the photography you said uh, there were uh, buildings that were done uh, that could not be photographed because there was no photography, because there was no photography to, to take the pictures of the buildings. But in the utopian times, utopian architecture, you said uh, there were ideas, photographs, that were built into architecture, built into buildings. Is this the way that, uh, that uh, uh, sequence went through, like from, like we, we, Try, we began to build abstract buildings that I couldn't make, I couldn't, I couldn't form it, I'm sorry. It was, it was a delightful uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I answer this immediately? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this remark and uh, I hope I did not misread architectural history for that. Make sure, since the Renaissance, we have this important decision between disegno interno and disegno esterno. Disegno interno is the idea that we have. 
is the idea that we have of a building, of an image, of something. And the Diseño Esterno is the actual building, the actual work that is done. Uh, the drawing, the etching, the whatever. And um, of course these both designs play with each other from time to time. And they inter uh, interfere with them. And that's what I was describing. There was a need for a perfect rendering of the actual world because the ideas of the utopian objects went away from the actual world. The gap between the drawings, the ideas, the utopian ideas and the actual buildings were getting larger and larger. That's the reason why I've shown this anonymous book on uh, architecture as uh, a psychological subject with the silhouettes of, of uh, buildings because then you see that the actual building is not as beautiful as the utopian drawings think of. And that's why photography was invented. But the moment it was invented, the photographers wanted more. And that's the development I wanted to show. Başka sorusu olan var mı? Ben e, Aytül Büyüksaray Cezmir Devlet Opera Bölgesi Müdürü. E, my name is Aytül Büyüksaray. I am the director of Izmir State Opera and Ballet. So it's so nice to be here. It's so nice to see all these great buildings. And I hope one day we will also have an opera house like this. Although we have a historical and very beautiful place called Elhambra, I hope you will uh, able to come and visit you, us. I don't know, this time or maybe next time. Uh, so I would like to ask to Mr. Uh, Ahmed Ertu. Uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Ahmed Ertu, uh, you have seen so many opera houses. Uh, which one was the most impressive one? I would like to know this and why. Thank you. Uh, the most impressive one the, was the Paris Opera House uh, because I received a special permission to see the backstage of the opera where the artists were able to dance or costume workshops, etc. So I could take all the photographs of everything. And also, the, when you see the life in the backstage uh, of the opera, then the uh, building starts to live and then you get to know the artists. And uh, within the metropolitan area, the opera uh, building added a great energy to Paris. And I think the goddess of the opera houses is the Paris Opera House. Everyone thinks well, the, it is the La Scala in Milan, and I think La Scala is a list uh, because uh, the management is very close towards the artists. And for example, uh, it lasted six months to receive a permission to get into Scala, and so. Uh, however, in all the other opera houses, um, uh, they were very open to us. All the other opera houses were very open to us. And therefore, the Paris Opera is a very special place in my uh, heart. It is a living creature today. Yes, I he was so nice interpreting for me. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Professor Zaksa very much as an artist and it is wonderful to hear his interpretations about me. Özellikle insan bundan sonra çekeceği fotoğrafların ne yöne gidebileceğini bu tarihsel perspektif içinde gördüğü zaman yeni bir e, enerji ve vizyonla tekrar başlama şeyi geliyor. Onun için e, 
bu gibi e, enerji alışverişleri çok önemli. Böyle bir olayın İzmir'de olması da çok e, iyi oldu. Yani bu sanat merkezini uluslararası bir boyuta taşıyan ikinci bir konferans serisi oldu bu sergi sayesinde. Onun için de çok mutluyum. E, hepinize çok teşekkür Ahmet. ederim burada bu salonda olduğunuz için. Ahmet Bey size bir soru daha var. Merhaba Ahmet Bey. Ben Ege Üniversitesi fotoğraf topluluğundayım da. Hey, üniversitedeyiz. Biz yani yeni yeni fotoğraf çekmeye başlıyoruz. Bir söyleşinizde şey demiştiniz yanlış hatırlamıyorsam. E, insanlar bu yaşlı insanların fotoğraflarını çekmeyi bırakmalı. Yani e, farklı yönlere yönelmeli artık gibi. E, bize öneriniz ne olabilir yeni başlayan in olarak fotoğraf çekmeye? Yani ne özel odaklanmalıyız? Kendimiz açısından yeni bir yol mu çizmeliyiz? Yani siz orijinal bir yer bulmuşsunuz kendinize. Hem İzmir'e bakmanız lazım. İzmir'i 24 saat yaşayın. İzmir'i sürekli izleyin. Yorulduğunuz zaman tekrar başlayın. Ee, bir de dışarıya bakın. Yani sürekli yani ben mesela 20 yıl Osmanlı mimari yapıtlarını çektim. Bizans çektim. Fotoğraflarıma hiç kimse ilgi göstermedi. Ve böyle kızmaya başladım. O zaman dedim ki Batılıların bildiği en iyi eserleri çekeceğim. Ve o zaman herhalde bu Geçmişte çektiklerimin değerini... I will uh, make the photographs. So this is very important. Uh, for example, I made the photograph of New York Library and uh, this was the first photograph uh, I took. And then suddenly... Um, so uh, my work was uh, sold within a week. So I attracted the attention. And therefore you have to work also outside. Uh, for example... Uh, so you have to take the photographs of the industrial plants in Germany or the libraries and so uh, you should move, you should travel and uh, this is, you have to be a courageous person. For example, three months a year I have to uh, have a physiotherapy because of carrying very uh, heavy things and my knees, my joints, everything is ill because of that and you have to uh, work very hard and you have to work uh, with a film and with the digital cameras you cannot do anything and uh, you are the master and uh, so you are the one who is directing the light etc and so you should uh, work continuously and uh, there's one more question mm -hmm. I understand I'm with you uh, why uh, opera houses and ballet houses. Uh, uh, I'm very much interested in it. When I was six years old, my father took me to opera houses and to the ballet, etc. And uh, I have many important friends who are opera artists. And I only take the photograph uh, which impresses me, which excites me. And therefore, on this, so I live what they live. So you have to feel what the opera artists feel. And if you feel, then you can take the photographs. said that, that you take the photographs uh, which you feel, which you feel. Uh, how much time do you spend to take the photographs of an opera house? Uh, for example, uh, for this photo, for one photo here, how much time do you spend to take the photo? Uh, I act according to my instincts, and the instincts are very much uh, developed in the architects. And when I get into a, a premise, I know where to stop, and so I, I make my decision immediately. And uh, my first decision is always the correct decision. So I learned this in uh, Japan in 1978, where to stop when I get into a building, where to stop. 
and you start there. So how are you going to feel uh, the heart of a premise? And because everyone can take the same photograph. Her ikisi de farklı yönlerde kalplerin e, nabzını, ritmini ölçüyor. E, o biraz sizin kimyanıza bağlı. Ben çok şanslıyım ki İstanbul gibi bir yerde e, uzun yıllar geçirdim. Hem Bizans, hem Roma, hem e, Osmanlı e, kültürlerinin katmanlarını da tanıdım. E, Japonya'yı da tanıdım, İran'ı da tanıdım. Ve bütün bunlarla birlikte bakıyorum bir esere. Bir soru daha var efendim. Ben de her ikinize de sorayım. I would like to ask a question to both of you and to Mr. Ahmet Ertuğrul and to, to Mr. Schlosser. So there is a visual symmetry in the photographs. And the architect, asymmetry is an important concept for the architect and for the photographer. However, you are also afraid of the symmetry, and so symmetry is uh, has been uh, always uh, seen as a very important. And now, uh, so this symmetry is important, and uh, so this visual symmetry is very important to have an impressive photograph. And uh, so. How did you decide on creating the symmetry, or uh, uh, what do you think uh, about the symmetry within the photographic history? Um, I'm very grateful to the interpreter who sits in the room beside me, doing all this wonderful work for me. Um, <coughs> Symmetry in art uh, and architecture would be another lecture, at least, of two hours. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um, because there are many concepts that speak pro-symmetry and against symmetry, of course, and you have to decide it individually. I would say two points with the work of Mr. R2. Uh, one would be some of his images are over symmetrical. They are so symmetrical that it's entirely difficult to understand how they are. Uh, I remember when we were visiting Mr. Artu's studio with my students and with a, an architect who was a friend of mine and built my own house, uh, we were looking at the staircase of the Palais Garnier, of the photograph that is hanging down at the entrance here. And we were deciding with looking at the photograph that the building is asymmetrical, not the photograph. <laughs> and it means that on the width of a staircase of roughly 8 meters 50, there was a difference of 2 or 3 centimeters, which you could read on the photograph, which you never be able to read when you walk there. Yeah. And so he is so symmetrical, so perfect in the symmetry of his images, yeah, that you see any fault of the architecture, which is quite interesting to understand, because you understand that this architecture is a man's work too. And uh, so what is art about? Yes, because, see, art is always about other art. Yeah, any painter who paints an impressionist painting knows the history of painting and chooses his me media, his means, his colors, his brush width, whatever, by understanding what the others did and how he now tries to differ himself from that. So Mr. R2 went into the buildings, understood them as an architect, and decided on this extreme symmetry to be able to understand where this architecture has its own problems, where it has its own understandings. The interesting thing is, these images are magnif magnificent, but they are not the ones that you will keep in mind. That's the, the problem that you have with a, an exhibition like this. So if you see the same Palais Garnier with the foyer or with the other places, they keep a lot more in mind because you do not think about the symmetry. 
But in this image, the symmetry is over obvious. And so I understand him that he took, of the same staircase, he took a second photograph, which I have shown here in my lecture. Because I consider this more dealing with the light and less with the building, or with the light that was designed for the building and is in the building like it was. But it is a decision of the artist which image to choose, which image to show, which image to, to prepare for that. And so you have at least a double symmetry, the symmetry of them who build it and the symmetry of them who take a photograph. You have at least two arts following each other with the symmetry. Yeah? And uh, as we have this wonderful example of the Palais de Musica in Barcelona just in front of us here, uh, there he deliberately choose to, to change the subject t totally. Yeah, it's neither symmetrical nor it is uh, in the way of a conventional photograph. It's simply this horse, is, this, this uh, flying horse is jumping into the image and distracting from the depth of the room. And it's distracting from the otherwise very important glass ceiling that's normally overemphasizing everything in the building. So he's deliberately taking his own chances between symmetry and asymmetry. And, but because the buildings are designed a different way. If there's an asymmetrical building with Santiago, like Santiago Calatrava's opera house that he's been photographing, this building is more or less asymmetrical. What he, does he do? He takes a symmetrical photograph, which Calatrava will hate. <laughs> It doesn't answer your question, but, but it's a sort of idea to it. <laughs> One more question. Uh, thank you for a great talk and great photographs. Um, my question is actually to both of you. Uh, you, are, you are mentioning the inspirations like miniatures and the earlier Turkish photography. Are these uh, inspirations, did you uh, come up to these uh, yourself after studying, uh, after seeing the photographs or was it after interviews and talks, after many talks with the artist himself? Because we as art historians, architectural historians, are not really that lucky to have you know, this chance to be in contact with the artists of the you know, earlier times. So um, it's about the inspirations, basically. Hi, hi. Another two-hour lecture on hermeneutics, yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, no, just a very short answer. I love to work with people who are alive, uh, even if the subject is bad. I must uh, yeah, admit, I spent 25 years of my life on researching on Nazi history in Germany. Because I had the feeling in my generation you have to do it. So I wrote the only photographic history of Nazi photography that is existing in the world. And um, I took roughly a hundred interviews for that. They were telling me lies and lies and lies and lies, but they were interesting lies. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you have to distract from that. And of course, we have, as you as an art, uh, disposed yourself as an art historian, I can admit that. When I was stu studying, we always had the notion only a dead artist is a good artist because he cannot interfere with your interpretation. That's the other way around. Uh, I'm very open to that, but I have the feeling myself that when I'm showing Mr. R2 images to which his work relate, which I know that he cannot know, it's easy enough for me too. Because you might say there's a sort of epigenetical uh, disclosure of uh, culture that you get through into your life and as we both are old men now uh, we have had a share of culture but uh, this is one answer to that the other answer the strict answer is of course hermeneutics saying okay you have to decide which part you take which part you take for more important is the visual heritage more important or is the uh, audio or uh, oral uh, heritage more important or is it the writing of others 
because when we start in art history, we have to read art history. And then we are influenced by other art historians. And we have to cope with that. And we have to free ourselves from that. Otherwise, we are not able to write our own stuff. And that's all of these deliverances that are there. So what I can tell you, mix it. Uh, thank you. Maybe I would like to add something uh, as an answer to this question. In my career as an architect, uh, I work with Kashan Gardens, all the symmetric gardens, uh, and the symmetry in the uh, Persian architecture. And also in Istanbul, I have seen hundreds of uh, carpets and the carpets uh, from the 16th century. I have examined all these carpets. And all the perspective here. Uh, so, uh, this is all about my uh, effect, uh, by, of, of my being affected uh, by this design of the carpets. And uh, the designers are always the same designers. Uh, carpet is something symbolic. And also the gardens, uh, Zen gardens, Buddhist gardens, or Kashan gardens. And uh, the perspectives there in these gardens are uh, something which appeal to me. Uh, the carpets might be misleading for you, but uh, and all these carpets have impressed me and they have uh, given me an inspiration in my career. And the carpets and the gardens in Kashan, in Persia, they have given me inspiration. And also the shopping areas, they have, they have given me the inspiration for my work. La a last question, a last question. I would like to thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much.